Hey, this is Texas country musician Bree Bagwell inviting you to check out my podcast, Only Vans. Listen, love it, and subscribe now on the Bluegrass Situation Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. It's where I come to you from my backyard in my van. Well, actually, we upgraded to an RV, but it still has the front end of a van, so it still counts. So basically, I get all my friends and we sit right here with my dog. This is whiskey. And we talk about important things like feet pictures, getting told you look tired, dating in the music scene. Listen, love it, and subscribe now on the Bluegrass Situation Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, and welcome to Basic Folk, where we have honest conversations with folk musicians on the Bluegrass Situation Podcast Network. Thank you for finding us today. I am Cindy Howes. I host this podcast. I am very happy to welcome co-host extraordinaire Lizzie No. Hi, Lizzie. Well, hi there, Cindy. Sorry I was late to our recording. I was waxing my face. Really? You wax your face? Do you wax your face at home? Mm-hmm. Well, not my eyebrows. I take those to a professional. Wow. I once got a little bit of waxing done because, not to brag, but I got hired for this Allure photo shoot where they were doing hairstyles of the different decades. And so I was like, okay, like I don't want to have a barely perceptible mustache for this shoot. But then I went to get it to get my face waxed and they burned me. Oh no. They burned my face. So like oh. instead of instead of showing up to my big photo shoot with like a beautiful shiny face, what I showed up with was like a mustache shaped burn. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and they had to do a lot of makeup to cover that up. <laughs> oh my god. Well, listen, if you'd like to stay in touch with us, we can let you know what's going on with our folk podcast, Uh, maybe a little bit about uh, waxing tips. We can never talk about waxing again, Cindy. We're done with it. (laughs) This is it. One and done. People are going to ban women from podcasts after this episode. Uh, You can sign up for our newsletter at basicfolk.com. There's also a link in the bio. No, link in the show notes. There's also a link in bio. There's a freaking link everywhere. You can sign up for our (laughs) newsletter. If you're not on it already, it's disgraceful. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. We're also on YouTube, at Basic Folk Pod. We post cute videos of our guests. And also on Instagram, I post pictures of my dog and my wife. And if you're a contributor of Basic Folk, thank you very much. Um, Honestly, uh, sometimes I'll, like, get donor box emails that say, like, confirming people giving, like, 5 or $10 a month. And that makes me feel really good. And then occasionally it'll say, like, donor box donation failed from this particular donor. And I actually have, like, a small heart palpitation because, like, there's, there's maybe about, like, 30 or 40 people that donate to Basic Folk and allow us to actually like create this podcast and not have me go uh, broke. So if your donation was recently, like if you switched a credit card or whatever, there's some kind of new information, like check it out. I can help you if you need help. Or if you want to become a contributor because you love us and you're like, oh, finally a podcast about folk music and waxing. Great. You can make your contribution now at the link in the show notes or go to basicfolk.com. Can I just do a testimonial for Cindy's ability to talk everyday people through technically challenging situations? (laughs) This woman single-handedly synced up my Google calendars, something that neither I nor anyone on my management team nor any of my loved ones have been able to do for for like (laughs) hundreds of years. Finally, Cindy figured it out. And Cindy might be the only person who actually knows my schedule because she's so good with Google Calendar. So if you do need help updating your credit card info, I highly recommend speaking to Cindy. And this is not a scam. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. So many scams in the world. I do want to say one more thing about waxing. Is when go. The the places I would go get a pedicure sometimes, I would go to get the pedicure and they'd be like, do you want to do you want to wax? Like and they would like gesture to like upper lip. Mm -hmm. And I was like. No, thank you. No, like, fuck off. Like, you're Speaking telling me scans, that I need one. Yeah, you one. go in there, you're vulnerable, and then they're like, mm, do you want to take care of that glaring flaw in your appearance? Yeah. Or do you yeah. want to just, like, look terrible? All right, let's talk about our guest today. We have not even mentioned his name. Okay, it is no exaggeration to say 
that I have waited over 20 years to talk to today's guest, who is Ryan Miller of Guster. Um, I became a fan of this New England indie outfit in 2003 when I saw them open for John Mayer at the West Point Military Academy, of all places. Um, the vibe in the room was a little stiff, but Guster was anything but. Um, their exuberant, generous, harmony-filled, idiosyncratic performance blew my teenage mind. And as I dug deeper into their lore, I discovered that I was a part of a vast network of weirdos. Yes, the Guster fandom. On this episode of Basic Folk, I got to sit down with lead singer Ryan Miller to talk about all things Guster, from their tried-and-true collaborative writing process to the theatrical delights of their recent We Also Have Eras tour, um, to what it really looks like to make environmental sustainability a priority on tour. Um, Guster is about to release their ninth studio album, Ooh La La, and as we talked about the new record, um, I got to talk to Ryan about how these new songs touch on questions that the band has been asking throughout their over 30-year career. Um, for example, Maybe We're All Right calls back to the collectivist spirit that I loved in 2003's Keep It Together. Um, Gauguin Cezanne talks about God in a way that brought up new questions for me about 2009's album, Easy Wonderful, and so on and so on. Um, this is what makes being a Guster fan so rewarding. The longer you listen to these guys and the deeper you dig, the more you feel empowered to ask questions about the world around you and approach the answers with playfulness. Guster is a band, but it is also a place where we all meet to dance away the big questions with whimsy to the beat of tasteful hand drums. Mm, that's beautiful. Thank you. I really love Guster. Uh, this is going to be great. Sit back and enjoy. We're going to check out a clip from the new album, Ooh La La. This is the folkiest track on the record called The Elevator. And then we'll get to our conversation between Lizzie No and Ryan Miller from Guster on Basic Folk. Boy, I know who you are. Your skin is my skin as you blood is my blood. Nothing's wrong. It's just a celebration. I can't just keep them waiting. I miss you when I'm gone. Welcome to Basic Folk. Um, this isn't in my script or any of my notes, but I want you to know on a personal note that I have been waiting 20 years for this interview. Oh, wow. And I am so excited to have you on the pod. It's a lot of pressure. Yes, I've been a Guster <laughs> fan for, I, I worked it out last night. I became a Guster fan 20 years ago this March when I saw you guys open for John Mayer at the West Point Military Whoa. Academy Theater. Whoa. Um, I barely remember that so, show. Well, I looked up your tour diaries from that time, and they confirmed that you all felt as tense as I felt. <laughs> I remember as a middle schooler being like, "This, the vibe here is very tense, but this band seems really fun. Um, <laughs> And in the tour diaries, you guys wrote that you walked around the campus and it was like very grim and scary. <laughs> that tracks. I mean, makes sense. And did you, are you still, um, are you still, are you still a John Mayer fan? Yes. Well, I don't really keep up with his doings. I'm going to be honest. Okay. Um, he's doing a lot. He, I'm old and frail. I'm old and frail. He's, he's, he's the lead singer of the Grateful Dead. Yeah. <laughs> Which is pretty cool. Pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I did not have that on my 20-year-ago bingo card for John Mayer. 
John Mayer might be the only musician ever to truly live their dream. Yeah. Like how many kids do you think <laughs> were growing up like, I'd like, you know what I want? I want to join the Grateful Dead. And I, he actually got to do I it. I feel you know? like most musicians that are living their dream, like, you know, like professional musicians. That's true. Yeah. I know, but the specific childhood dream. I don't know, but the thing, and I, we don't have to talk about John Mayer the whole time. And the, I'm going to I'm gonna basically exhaust my knowledge of him in, in about nine seconds. But okay, my great. understanding is that he came to the Grateful Dead very late. So I don't think he grew up liking the Grateful Dead. I thought you meant late for the Grateful Dead, for, late for the Grateful Dead. And I was like, I think we can all agree that <laughs> they were a band long before John Mayer no, <laughs> came I, along. I think it was 20 years, 10 years after you saw him where he be- found the Grateful Dead. Cause then I think oh, he, beautiful. I think he found it. And then he had an album where he was wearing like, uh, like a, a Raven claw and a whole poncho. You know what I mean? There's an album cover. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually really beautiful because he has like the fervor of the converted. Totes. It's, he didn't just like, he didn't just coast in. No, exactly. It wasn't like, oh, I guess I have to do this because I grew up liking it. It's like, no, this is great music. And now I will be the lead singer of the Grateful Dead. And he was able to manifest that. That's pretty cool. Wow. I'll give him that. A lot of respect for John Mayer. Yeah. Um, can we talk about a band called Guster? Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. I think of Guster as a band where the community around the band is a central part of the art. Um, your fans are diehard. They participate, they care. So how would you describe the Guster community and what has being in this band for almost 30 years now taught you about like how your creativity is related to like the, this shared experience of community? Well, you kind of said it at the beginning, like whatever it meant. You know what I mean? You said all the things. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> um, wait, so what's a, what's part A of the question? Like, how would you describe, if someone's never been to a Guster show, like, how would you describe the community around the band? Um, I mean... Like, if you were trying to tell, like, yeah. this is what my family's like, yeah. you know? How would I, you describe it? I mean, some of it at this point is, like, grown-ass women not unlike yourself Mm -hmm. will come up to me and be like, Oh, I've been listening to you since I was five, you know? And, and, and we're just, you know, for (laughs) me to, I always say like, I'm a huge fan of music. Like Mm -hmm. I go to see music all the time. I listen to music 24 seven, my kids and I, that's a very big part of our shared experience. And um, so I know what it's like to feel some way about a band. In fact, literally my 15 year old just, Instagram messaged me about a show they want to see next weekend, Ruth Garbus, who's coming. And uh, so I, we were talking about, so nice. I was like, Oh, Ruth Garbus is like, that's, that's related to tune yards. And, you know, like, so I know what it's like to feel about music. And so it's, it, it helps me understand to flip it around when people like yourself be like, Oh, I've been waiting mm-hmm. 20 years to kind of do this. So, it's a crazy, I mean, it's a crazy honor in that way. Cause part of me is just like, Oh, thanks. But then I, if I actually think about it, then I'm like, mm-hmm. Oh wow. That's nuts that we've been the soundtrack to your life. Or like, this was like, Oh, this happened when I broke up with my boyfriend or I lost right. a parent here. This is when I went to Europe when I was in college and it was the soundtrack of that and right. those feelings. So like I have all those feelings around music. Um, So it's like, it's, it's very, like, there's a lot of uh, gratitude around that and a lot of humility. Mm -hmm. Um, But it also is part of the experience. I mean, there's certain bands that sort of forge their own path and they have Mm -hmm. this sort of ecosystem, you know, Fish comes to mind, Dave Matthews comes Mm -hmm. to mind, um, probably a shit ton of metal bands, you know come yeah. to mind where no name is a little bit of a pioneer in that way with her like libraries and the way she engages with her fans. Oh, that's cool. I've only seen, I've only seen that. I saw her once and it was great, but I didn't realize that, yeah. but usually a lot of it comes along with like, and Taylor obviously, but like mm-hmm. it comes along with just, we're going to get back t- to that with time. Right. So it's the passage mm-hmm. of time. It's not like, Oh, I found this record. It is that thing that sort of, 
woven like inextricably woven throughout your life and and even like putting out this record now people are like mm-hmm. oh like i can see where this is this is going to be this part of my life or something mm-hmm. so um yeah i think just it's different if i was just in a band that just made a record it it's different than what we're doing it's almost it's not like a lifestyle but the yeah the word mm-hmm. community is is a really big part of it and it's why shows feel a certain way and that is like recognizing that honoring it you know playing within that is really a big part of what we're trying to do with all the things that we do, if that's our tour or our albums or messaging or whatever, we have to acknowledge that first. Um, you, can you, can we talk about the, we also have eras tour um, where you've taken songs from throughout your nine studio albums, you, and you've created kind of a theatrical experience a la Taylor Swift. So how the hell do you craft, like, how do you narrow it down? How do you decide which songs are going to be representative of a certain era. Like talk, can you talk about how you just like crafted this show? Yeah. I mean, I think it's funny. I'm writing, I'm doing, an, I, I hate doing written interviews cause I'm just not as, it just takes me a lot longer and I don't feel as articulate. Um, and that was, I was the exact same question I was working on when this, at, when I was like, Oh shit, it's nine o'clock. Um, okay, well let's workshop yeah, it. Yeah. Let's workshop it. Thank you. This will help me. <laughs> and then just send this back to me whenever I land. I Anytime. Mean, I'll, I'll hand transcribe. <laughs> I mean, I think like one thing that I was trying to figure out how to say in writing is that there's a lot of stuff everywhere all the time. Yeah. Like there's film and there's TV and there's just like to get people to come to a show. You can't just be like, cool, Guster's on tour for the 30th year in a row. Like we feel mm-hmm. like you have to kind of – people have to be compelled and really – I'll say this word a million more times probably, but like there has to be a depth of storytelling around like, why are you mm-hmm. going to see this show? Like why? And, um, and some of it you'd like, Oh, we're playing this album or we're doing this thing with a comedian or we're playing with an orchestra. Like you always kind of have to give, build a story around a show these days. You can't just coast on the fact that you saw us 20 years ago at West Point open up for John Mayer. So, <laughs> so I think there's, uh, I think there's, um, so we were trying to think about what to do for this tour and the album wasn't going to be ready. And, and honestly, like new album tour, isn't that compelling either. So we were trying to think of some stuff. Wait, don't tell that to my fans. <laughs> Guys, the Havsies tour is a once in a lifetime experience. <laughs> exactly. So we were trying to figure out like, what can we do to kind of make it like a be in or celebrate the fans, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I had a couple ideas that nobody liked that I was really mad about that they didn't like them. And what, what, what can you tell like well, one idea that you might yeah, save one, for later? Yeah, I don't know if it's good enough. I wanted it. Well, we did this on the first night of our fest. We have a festival every year in Maine. And the first mm-hmm. night we did like a, a prom night. Um, and so people dressed up and we did some karaoke and we had like a bad DJ. It was really fun. Wait, how did you hire the bad DJ? Was that? Oh, no, a it was a good, prompt? it was a good, it was a good DJ playing bad music. Okay. Or it was like we were playing like Footloose soundtrack and stuff. Um, okay. Oh, actually, the prom was an under the sea prom, which was even cooler. So it's like not oh, because a, of on the ocean. Yeah, exactly. But I was thinking like, let's do a prom. I wanted to do something with like costumes or just to kind of make it. I like that word, like a B in. Um, mm-hmm. But nobody liked my idea. And then Brian had Brian's a taylor swift fan like he and his kids Mm -hmm. listen to taylor he listens to the radio and was like well what if we do an eras tour and then i was like oh that's 10 times better than what i was thinking yeah and and i'm um i've got a musical that's happening and i was working on a time and now it's really happening but um I had just seen a cabaret. Do you know what like a proper Mm -hmm. cabaret is? Yes. Like where they tell the story of their life. Like I'm Liza Minnelli and I was nine years old when I first saw Giga Pants or whatever, you know. And Yes. My friend Amy, do you know Amy Irving? She did a, she did this Amy Irving. Oh yeah. She's famous. 
Yeah, she did a she did a, an album on this theme, and and the show was called Born in a Trunk, and it was about her whole life in showbiz. Like fabulous show. So a, a woman that I'm working with on this musical had a cabaret at Studio or Studio Fifty Four. Is that the place in Midtown mm-hmm. where they do it? And mm-hmm. I was like, oh my god, one day I want to do one of these. Like I think Augusta Cabaret would be great. So yes. Brian said the Eras thing, and I was like, oh my god, I was trying to figure out how we would ever do this. Cause I was thinking more like theatrical and it just like, as soon as he said it and we were like, Oh, it's got to have skits and costumes and props. And we tell the story, like we were all on board. And then Brian, like he just kind of like, he worked on it for a couple months. Like he wrote it. He just kind of showed up. We worked on it a little bit together, but really he like showed up with a 13 page script and he had the major beats. Like we talked about like, what are the important things like playing red rocks, like Steve Lily white and lost and gone forever, Mm -hmm. the origin story. Like, you know, so he kind of had these beats and built it all out and it was pretty complete. I mean, he did a really, he did an incredible job of really, and he's re- like a real heart person. He really like is a fan forward person. Mm-hmm. A lot of that stuff you're talking about, it's our personalities, but a lot of that proactive component was kind of out of Brian's brain. And then I brought in my friend who's a Broadway guy to kind of make sure we were doing it right. But we actually like, it was pretty fully formed just with the our collective experience on this stuff. Um, and we weren't really sure if it was going to work. I mean, we was really like, okay. I mean, we booked this whole tour even before we knew what we were doing. But um, after the first night, it was pretty, it was like, oh shit, this is really going to work. And it's going to be hard. Yeah. It's going to be hard to just go back to playing concerts after this <laughs> without this. <laughs> talk about it it kind of reminds me of like what people get out of a seder which is we tell the story of our community we talk about some of the up and ups and downs and at the end there's sort of like a shared understanding of where we've been and there's been you know different like somatic elements of like experiencing um art together do you feel like your audience is getting something different out of this tour than they would out of like a, a regular just we're gonna play the new songs like a non guster seder yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah i mean that it was it, it was kind of that's what i it it almost felt like oh shit like how that's what i was saying like kind of felt like a we're backed into a corner a little bit because we were able to do this and act and tell jokes and do all this stuff, mm-hmm. but also have them play music. I mean, we played 28 songs every night or 30, um, but it felt different. It felt like, oh, wow, like maybe we're more, not more than, like maybe we're more than a band, but there's, it, it, mm-hmm. you know, like the a lot of people like that have spent their life seeing shows and we're like i've never seen anything like that like it was one of the better you know like my friend like not to like well uh, in new york uh, will forte like came Mm -hmm. and like forte is a a powerhouse like he's an incredible storyteller he's made amazing stuff and like if will just came to a guster show i would be like oh i hope you liked it you know what i mean but like he loved like he was like that was crazy like you know like somebody like that who's somebody i deeply respect as a creator a storyteller entertainer and to be have him be like oh wow like what like that felt feels really i have a airplane flying over but might have to oh i thought it was a big scary dog no we live in the flight path i mean i live in the woods of vermont but we live in the flight path Mm -hmm. of the most expensive weapon ever built the (laughs) f-35 it's a weird weird juxtaposition of my rural life um (laughs) so sorry but (laughs) yeah i think that um it was a real it was a really big swing and it was really crafted with our fans in mind to not be mm-hmm. indulgent and to really kind of, and like to kind of tell the story. Cause it is an interesting story to, to have these dudes meet in a dorm room as mm-hmm. 18 year olds and be 50 years old and still be releasing music that feels vital. And so, mm-hmm. 
yeah, it's 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 a it's a pretty it's a pretty it was a pretty crazy experience. We definitely want to keep doing it, and really, the the bar is is the gauntlet is thrown to figure out how do we elevate everything kind of moving forward outside the context of this, you know? Oh, I love this. Um, well, speaking of releasing new music that feels relevant, um, your ninth album, Ooh La La comes out May 17th. Um, let's say for the sake of argument that this album is an alien organism that has arrived on earth with a specific purpose. Um, it is sentient, it has a backstory and it has a mission. What is the, this album's mission and what are some of its secrets? Oh, metaphor. Um, I think it's like a cat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it might be like a cat that wants to sit in your lap, but also mm -hmm. like, isn't just snoozy. Like it wants to play a little bit. And also, like, <laughs> we'll, like, walk around and be like, what's up? You know what I mean? It's a little sassy. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, but <laughs> Cindy's going to love this. I think it's because I saw Cindy's cat. That's maybe why I thought of it. Um, Her name's Dottie. She's a really important cat. My my joke was that Dottie, all I saw was Dottie's tail. My joke was that Dottie <laughs> was only a tail. Like, that it's oh, just. It, it, no, no, no. No, but it was like a fake tail that she just wags to try and ingratiate herself because who doesn't love a, a fuzzy cat? <laughs> Uh, speaking of, who doesn't love a fuzzy cat? Um, yeah, I mean this. Everybody loves a fuzzy exactly. cat. Exactly. So I think this is alien, alien cat. Like it's mm -hmm. it's a little bit like like the first the first review of the record came out uh, yesterday, or I saw the first review, and and I'm reading a lot of. And the Guster fans have had the record. Like we sold like 500 CDs at our CD release party. So sure. there's a handful of people fans who have had the had the record, and I'm starting to get reactions to it but it seems like it's very well received like better and i was trying to make sense of it a little bit like our last album was not um it was a different production mm -hmm. it was not as it wasn't a cat it was like it was like a cliff that you had to climb that was awesome but not everybody wants to climb a cliff sometimes you want to sit in your chair with a cat so yep. i think that the reaction to this album has been extremely positive um because it's a very gentle entry and and there's it does it's not too challenging sonically i mean we know how to write songs at this point i'm not gonna no mm -hmm. false humility like we're we're good songwriters and thank god yeah right i don't like when people come on the pot no people don't really do that <laughs> on this podcast but when people are like i just can't believe how people are receiving the record no, well like, the res you know what you're doing well, the, you know the you're reception doing. is something i can't control in fact like yes. the last album i don't think was received like i think those songs are great too but i don't know that yes. they were received um as well as i think the tunes were but but this one seems to have, have like caught and 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 there was a lot like with josh kaufman you know we're, he's mm -hmm. really like a heart soulful guy we talked a lot about the heart and the emotionality um and i think we were focusing on that and that might be what people like about our band or want right now or just what yes. you know what's good about some music like i don't always like music like that but sometimes that's exactly what i want um so i'm really like I think that these songs, I think this record is going to like kind of wedge itself in to the, you know, we always, I always think about it like the Guster canon, you know, like yes. there are songs that you play on the Eras tour. You have to play, come downstairs and mm -hmm. say hello. And like, you know, there are these songs that are in the canon and, and I've, it's always my goal. It's not to have like a hit record or anything. It's more sort of like, well, how many of these can we, will end up living in the canon and in a way that just mm. like, become part of people's lives and it's funny like you know i do i do lurk on the guster message board sometimes and people will be like oh man does anybody like not for nothing which is the last song on our last mm -hmm. record and people are like that is the most you know so it's not always within the first two months two weeks two months two years that a song will find someone um and that's true now with just the algorithm and tiktok and oh, yeah. all that these songs will have you know can have an opportunity to find their their people like years from now but i'm really like i'm really proud of these like i've been listening i listen a lot to our album 
pretty much until it comes out. And then I pretty much mm-hmm. never listen to it again. But yes. like even yesterday I was driving home from New York and I was listening to the four songs on Spotify. And I was like, these are really like, I'm really proud of them. They sound really good mm-hmm. there. I can sense like, you know, the depth of storytelling that I'm like trying to do, like I'm trying to talk about some shit. Like we were listening to, this morning on the way to school, me and my kids, we were listening to this song. I don't want to throw them under the bus. All right. We're just, we were listening to a song that we really okay. like and it's got a groove and it sounds good. A Guster song? No, or, just a song. Or just a song on the radio. No, a song on Spotify that like is in our list that we listen to. Cause my, okay. my 15 year old was like, Oh, I love this song. And I was like, Oh, mm-hmm. that's a jam. And we listened to it. We were reading the lyrics and we we're like, this is not it, man. Like, what are you talking <laughs> about? You know? And so yeah. I think, I'm trying not to do that as much and haven't for a while where I'm like, I don't want to just say words because they kind of sound good. I kind of want it to be Mm. about some or be evocative. Maybe those words just weren't evocative for me. For me, I can't speak to your intentions in writing, but the song Maybe We're All Right feels like a spiritual bookend to keep it together, which is a really important song to me. What's your relationship to hope right now? And do you feel like it has evolved since the keep it together days? Like, do you see that through line? I mean, it's an interesting thing. Like I, I, it's almost like the hopefulness thing has been in our DNA since, you know, like during the pandemic, we printed a shirt that said, uh, be calm, be brave. It'll be okay. Mm-hmm. And it was like fucking gangbusters, you yeah, know, of course. because it was that time. And I think that sentiment of the band, like manifest destiny, like move forward, do slow. I don't even know what the lyric is. Face forward, move slow, forge ahead. Like mm-hmm. this, like, and the concept of ever motion. Yeah, exactly. Like the concept of ever motion. Like I think this mm-hmm. idea of hope and optimism and choosing that, you know, if this again with the storytelling thing, it's like, look, the, the universe exists how it's going to exist. And all we can do is change mm-hmm. our reaction to it. I mean, that's really my, that's my life's philosophy. Yeah. And it, it's been a big part of who I am and just like it really internalizing that and using it in every part of my life. And it's a very, like, I was like, I discovered this. And then I figured out like, there's this whole thing, yeah. stoicism. That's like, that's really mm-hmm. what it is. It's like, oh, that's, there's my new religion, I guess. But so I think it's almost so much a part of it that I was like, I just don't want it to beat that horse sure. over and over. And I'm trying to find, I mean, that's what keep mm-hmm. going is. That's what maybe we're all right. And it's not a pandemic record, you know, but it was written during yes. that. So it's hard for that to not, you know, that's burning in the background of like, and the Trump shit and everything where you just like gesticulates wild, yes. you know, widely. And they're like, oh, well, and I've always kind of liked writing song. Like the songs from the beginning were always, they weren't really small stories. They were very existential a lot of times. And so I think I'm a pretty, I am an optimist. I'm not an optimist, but I do really buy into this idea that you kind of have to create your own you know, framing and storytelling internally is really the whole trick. So I think that stuff does, has to come through in lyrics where I'm trying to write about Mm -hmm. something meaty, you know, that's going to mean something to Lizzie 15 Mm -hmm. years from now, you know? Okay. Well, actually speaking of exactly that, 15 years ago, you released Easy Wonderful, which is an album that I love. And it's a funny album for for me in terms of the Guster canon, because it's a, it's playful as a lot of your songs are, but the topics are like God and belief. And it seems like you're talking about magical thinking. And the sound of that album is like this playful kind of quirky pop sound. Um, looking back, like in this kind of post Trump era, how are you reflecting on those little vignettes Um, And the way that the band was thinking about belief and optimism and hope um, on that record. 
Well, I think it feels consistent. I mean, I, sorry to be that guy, but I don't even remember. I'm looking up right now what songs are on there. <laughs> well, you have a lot of albums. You're allowed. I don't. I, I know. It's like, well, what rec- and pl- and we play all these songs. I guess I was thinking specifically about how like there's a lot of like there's like a lot of hand claps and really like. Uh, the back, like the backing <laughs> vocals have so much gusto and it feels like very tongue in cheek. Um, and like you had some particular things to say about magical thinking. Um, so I was curious about like, if you remember what the state of mind was in terms of like when you were making production choices and arrangement choices. Um, and if you feel like how you feel about that now? I mean, easy, wonderful was the really, we talked, did you see the show that no, the heiress I haven't. Thing? I've just been reading the Um, reviews and descriptions of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like the low moment of our career was like kind of in the easy, wonderful thing when we had a really toxic producer that the the wheels came off the bus for the first time ever. And last time ever, we just like didn't talk for like a couple months. It just like we, it broke us. So I think that maybe if there was some like deep psychological, um, diving to figure out where that came from. I mean, I think writing an upbeat record, I mean, we always mm-hmm. love that dichotomy of like the really upbeat song and the really oh, depressing yeah. lyrics. I think that's just something I, uh, to write big, happy pop songs that have this like, Oh wait, what the fuck are they talking <laughs> about? You know, like D- do you oh love me gosh, is basically yeah. about the dis- <laughs> uh, the dissolution of a relationship, but I played it at somebody's wedding and I'm like, okay, oh if God. you want, uh, but I always, I love that dichotomy. I think it was like, I learned it from watching you Morrissey mm-hmm. um, kind of vibes. And I, yeah, I, th- I think those kind of big shiny beach boys, ebullient, joyous production choices are kind of like when we were really unapologetically mm-hmm. leaning into that and feeling like the, the lyrics that were existential and maybe somewhat, uh, you know, those would help, uh, those that was mm-hmm. serve as ballast. So it wasn't, mm. they wouldn't just float away, you know? Um, so yeah, I think, I think there's a little bit more pressure when we write a really upbeat tune for me to kind of yeah. ground it somehow. <laughs> so maybe that's just the songs we were writing and I was like, all right, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't often, I don't start off with like, oh, I want to write a song about this. Mm-hmm. Really? I've never really done that. I just, we write music and I have melodies and then I have to kind of do this weird reverse engineering of like, mm-hmm. what words sound good there? What feels like it's going to stick and what's going to really, you know, make this the best version of itself. So a lot of times it's almost like solving a, a crossword puzzle more than like, uh, I'm going to write it, like having an assignment from your songwriting teacher. And when you say we write music, do you mean... You're sitting in a room together, improvising and playing. Are you talking about you'll demo a little melody and bring it to the band? Like, what's that process like in general? Or if that's too big of a question, like, what was that like on this record, on this new record? Yeah, I mean, this record, I think a lot of it was us Mm -hmm. sitting in a room together. You know, like, we would get together for three or four days and just like someone would play a riff and someone else and be like, Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Can you play that again? And I would sing a melody and, and, um, and then I would take that home and then no matter what, no matter however we get the music, it's always, I got to take it back here and write the words. And that's really hard. Um, and then kind of send them around and, and hope that everybody likes them. I mean, a couple songs on this were Mm -hmm. like black balloon. I wrote and like, 30 minutes, just like literally like right there, you know, um, just came in a day and pretty much wholesale and same thing. I was sitting here and there's the second Mm -hmm. song when we were stars was me just screwing around with some splice loops and just writing it and, and sending it to sending it to the band and being like, is this a song? They're like, yeah, that's a song. Oh, and keep going. I had written, um, with a pal of mine, Rob, we had just, we were trying to write some mm-hmm. songs for licensing, um, like for commercials or film. And he and I just got on really well and just wrote a bunch of cool, weird, like never thought they would be Guster tunes. And I had played them for, I was like, here's mm-hmm. five songs I wrote with Rob and, and 
I, Brian was like, oh, that could be a Guster song. And that pretty much was exactly what Rob and I did. So, you know, I'd say the, the majority of it is the is us in a room and then I can take them back. But sometimes they'll come more from my world just because I'm writing a ton. Um, this might be an unholy question, but I'm curious, like for, you know, the, some people that listen to our show are artists and songwriters themselves. And I think a lot of people would be curious to know how you guys are making records now with all of the knowledge of like how the industry has changed since you got started. Like the way people consume music is different. The economics of putting records out is different. Does that ever cross your mind when you're creating or do you try to really like keep all of like the outcomes outside of the studio. You mean in terms of like, are we trying to write a single or are you talking about? Yeah. And like, are you, yeah. Do you, do you write differently now that like streaming is the primary way that people are consuming? Well, actually in some ways, I think there's a lot less, like we didn't ever really talk about a single on this record or like mm -hmm. what's the, or now they didn't call a single, they call it like a lead track where it was right. way more prevalent, especially in the major label system and, and understanding. Right. But I think, you know, it was like, it was, it was something, it was, of course it makes sense now, but it was something like, it really occurred to me, I think my kids like four or five years ago, like Mac DeMarco, and I was mm -hmm. like, and it was just like crushing everywhere because of the algorithm, because of, and this was even pre-TikTok, I think, but now it really doesn't have to, fit into a format of like triple a radio or hot ac radio or pop radio it just has to be a song that compelling that is one with itself yes. to, in order for it to be like a hit or to travel or whatever so in some ways it really freed us up to think about like well what's just the like let's just make something that feels like itself and you just and you never mm. know what's going to be the thing that like there's famously like galaxy 500 the guy is like their their most like their weirdest track is the one that has the most plays on spotify but and it sounded nothing like the rest of the band and it's not like a big hot like cool pop song i mean it's just a great song and so i think in some ways in terms of like you know, surveying the landscape, it's really like, well, let's just make a great fucking record. And knowing, especially knowing that our fans are going to listen to it, like mm -hmm. that our fans are going to actually give it a shot. So it doesn't have to like scream, hey, look at me. It can be a quiet mm -hmm. song, like maybe we're all right, that, you know, yeah. that could be enough to like be a big vehicle for promotion. But I, I mean, we're not really big on that kind of stuff anyway, because it our career has never been fueled by those those mm -hmm. like where we can kind of slip through the cracks and enter into the into the larger conversation because of a promotional thing. It's been like we just kind of put our heads down and try and make great records each time and put on compelling shows and can really focus on our community and focus on storytelling and just build our universe within it. And so that's why this feels really, there's a real validation that this album is being received this way, that mm -hmm. it's like in this very heartful way, because it's that, that heart is like, is what binds this whole thing together. So if there's these songs now, like that means something to people, that's, the biggest hit song we could ever have in a way, yeah. you know, more so than if something went viral on TikTok. Although I don't, I don't have a beef with things going viral on TikTok either because, you know, like that can also work really well, you know, that's yeah, a lot of the kids are on TikTok. Yeah. Different, different conversation. Yeah. We are on the basic folk podcast and yeah can you tell me what this is a little bit i meant to ask you before so what what is this podcast so the good thing is that there aren't any rules um we are distributed by the bluegrass situation podcast network and we're called basic folk but we don't really have any boundaries around what folk music is cindy and i will some like periodically sit down and be like what does the folk thing mean my belief is that it has more to do with like the way that folk 
and for the listeners at home, I'm making air quotes, the way that folk musicians and fans engage with music. Like I think about like, you know, music folk and like how folk music is like a way of working, a way of relating to your fans, a way of being in the world, a way of thinking about storytelling. Um, and I'm curious what you think Guster's relationship is to folk music. Um, and especially if, would you describe Witness Tree on this new album as a folk song? Um, and do you think about, like, do you think about creating folk songs and fables? Yeah, the folk thing is a funny one for me. And I, and I can't, I can't say that I've thought a lot about this. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not like, oh, thank God you opened. I've always wanted to talk no, about no, this. No, no, no. <laughs> but, but, you know, like, I'm, I'm really, really good friends with, Eric Johnson, who's part of Bonnie Light Horseman, mm -hmm. and that's how I know Josh Kaufman, who Kaufman. made the record. And and Anais is a new friend of mine. Um, we live, you know, I saw her last week, or she's been my my Sherpa for the musical stuff I'm working on. Yes. She's um, an old buddy of Cindy's. Oh, cool. And Anais so she's is a friend of the pod. And so actually, like they have been a little bit of a conduit for me to understand folk, especially because that first Bonnie record was mm -hmm. about reinterpreting. Like they are so steeped and 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 eric too like when i met mm -hmm. eric he's a he's got a great ear and was you know i think was maybe was it bert janch but there was a lot of that early it was mm -hmm. like all that cool early 60s british folk stuff that he kind of turned me on to and like yeah it's Do you crazy get into steel eye span no what is that oh my god i'm gonna put this on I right now i am obsessed with steel eye it span it's uh, Steel Eye Span. I, Steel Eye Span. Oh, there you go. They have this album all around my hat. It's oh, going to blow it your mind the way they. Oh, the I recognize this of cover. Their, of their sound. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just put that in. Um, I love technology. I'm like, oh, I have to go Ooh. to a record store and order and import. It costs $60 and wait six months. I'm like, no, I just hit a plus no. button and I'll listen to it this afternoon. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I can't. I can't speak to the folk stuff as much as like, I mean, listen, I listen to, you know, half this shit. I know what folk music is as a, as a listener. Um, and mm -hmm. we're playing Newport folk for the first time this year. And I've gotten spent some time with Jay. And like, so now there's like, there was always like, we never got invited there. And I was like, are we not a folk band? But of course that's very loose. I think it, he uses the same interpretation that you do. Um, but there is, I mean, listen, there, there, for me, folk music is a lot, uh, you know, it's a lot about storytelling and it is a lot about heart and it is a lot about like, there's a very, and it is a lot about the existential too. So, and when we started, like when we first, first started, because we were two acoustic guitars and bongos, we were a folk band. We were playing folk grooves. We like played Passim and we were playing with right. like, like, and it didn't, we weren't a folk band, but, but then well, when we got, I got into Guster, I thought of you as like a folk band. Cause I was, I listened to Parachute and the way that right. you were singing in harmony and right. the tactility of the way that you played your instruments was very folky to me. There are definitely touchstones of folk, like the acoustic guitars, the, mm -hmm. the harmonies, like the lack of like electric instruments on our first couple records. So like it, it I don't, I never bristled against it, but we weren't yeah. in the folk tradition in that sense. Like, we were a rock band using some of the touchstones of folk music, but like, but yeah, I mean, if you listen to, you know, you listen to black balloon, like yeah. that's a, why isn't that a flat? That's literally a dude in acoustic guitar singing a story. Like that's a folk song. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it's an interesting arg It to be an interesting exercise to go through music and, and try and uh, differentiate like what, songs are folk songs and what mm -hmm. aren't like i i would that's a fun exercise but i think mm -hmm. in terms of like i i i would wear that as a badge of like oh yeah proudly to be considered in the tradition of folk music i mean i'm influenced by folk music you know like obviously you know paul and neil like mm -hmm. and like Paul Simon, Paul McCartney and Neil, like, uh, like these are all, these are the people that, 
that are stand at the not the very head but that's how i got my folk music you know mm-hmm. like was rem a folk band probably not we're talking heads a folk band no is wilco a folk band yeah i mean sort of yeah sort of yeah so in that sense yeah it's, it's an interesting i don't think it's ever been i've ever really had to be definitive about it but i mm-hmm. definitely there's through lines of folk music and it's a huge part of who i am as a listener i listen to a ton of folk music that's very like traditional folk music i had a i had a hunch about that um i have a question about your touring that i don't want to forget so through reverb and also just like ways that you've been public about your environmentalism guster has really led the way um in this movement for eco-friendly touring um I want to talk about the early days of reverb and your advocacy around like leaving less of a footprint um, as a touring band. Were there some practices like eco-friendly practices that were like super challenging to implement? Um, Were there times when you had to sacrifice what made business sense? How did you as a band make those decisions? Like keeping your longevity as a band in mind, um, like, at the same time that you were trying to like kind of take an activist stance on uh, the environment? Um, Well, you know, I will just start all of this, that this is all out of the brain of Adam, Mm -hmm. um, the other singer in the band and his wife, Lauren, who we also met in college and reverb started as like, you know, she, Lauren, I think she was environmental studies major or shit. I should probably know that, but she was sort of already in this space and was trying to figure out what she could do. And we were just like leaving bags of trash everywhere we went from the side of the road. Not really, but for touring, it was like, why don't we, why don't we start here? So it kind of came, we were the first test case for what reverb would eventually become of like, what practices can we put into place? You know, and that was the first time I ever heard the word greening something like Mm -hmm. was I, that was like pre everything. Adam and Lauren were kind of schooling us on this. Um, And, you know, what I liked about it was that it didn't, it wasn't dogmatic. It wasn't like, well, if you can't do any, like, it was like, let's just not, let's just use water bottles on this tour. Let's just not Mm -hmm. use 4,000 plastic bottles. Let's just have our water bottles and ask for a thing. And that felt like, yeah, yeah, but we're still using paper plates or styrofoam or whatever. It's like, yeah, let's, Mm -hmm. let's just take a thing at a time. So as a non-environmentalist by trade, I was, it really appealed to me because you didn't have to do everything. You just had to do something. And I think Mm -hmm. that was a big, that was a lot of the gas in the engine for reverb and was just like, let's try and do all this stuff helps. And then, And then artists who are passionate about it have a platform that they can talk about it, find other fans that are passionate about it and create Mm -hmm. a a movement. So, you know, it's been, it's been incredible to watch Adam do his thing. You know, two days ago, he and Billie Eilish's mom, who's her manager, like talked to like tens of thousands of people. And like he and Billy, Billy's really has been a big supporter of reverb. And, and he was on the cover of this big trade magazine. He and Lauren the other day, Mm -hmm. I mean, they're like, they're really, they've done a lot. They've actually done stuff. It's not just this sort of vanity project. They've like, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tours and like at the biggest level, you know, the worldwide stuff. So they've really, they've really changed the conversation, I think Mm -hmm. around this. And they were the first people to do it. And for us personally, it's just been like, we're just, I'm just proud to be associated with it. I'm proud to, you know, be a small part of it in terms of like being an early test case. I mean, listen, you asked if there was like shit that like, that's kind of a bummer. Like I like going on those cruises, you know, the cruises where they have like Kayamo. We did a, we did a bunch. I just did. I just went on for the first time. Cindy and I went and interviewed artists on board. Which one? Kayamo. Oh, you'd went on that one. So yeah. So like that one, like I love those cruises and Mm -hmm. Adam's like, we can never do a cruise again. And I'm like, why? It's like, they're horrible. Like it's a really tough conversation because it's a cool way to meet other artists and it's a cool experience for the fans. And And you have to like think about like, what's the impact going to be? Yeah. Oh yeah. And he's like, it's terrible and we can never do it. And so we got asked to do some cool ones and we just had to say no, but like, 
that's fine. <laughs> I'll live, you know, it's totally fine. But the sacrifices have that, that's my only, that's the only stick in my crog. It's because I liked, I always like doing the cruises. We can't do them anymore. But for the most part, no, they don't like, you know, we do biodiesel and all that. And it's just a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. So I haven't, I won't say it's required really any sacrifice on our part. Um, uh, to kind of to kind of toe the line, especially because that's the whole thing with reverb. It's like it doesn't want to push. It's not dogmatic. It's like do what feels right for you, and that will be enough. So yeah. All right. Can, do will you do some short lightning round questions with me? Yes, whatever you want. Okay. What is your favorite piece of merch that Guster has ever produced? Ooh, great, great. Um, we had oven mitts. That were so good, um, and I want to make oven mitts again. But if you if you use them, they would burn. <laughs> so, so not that effective were, <laughs> in their <laughs> in their in, intended in, purpose. Yeah, ineffective oven mitts. But it was a really that was a really that's probably my that's probably my favorite. I think we made like one bobblehead that no one bought, and Cute. yeah, that's probably. That's probably it. Yeah, the oven okay. mitt was it. What is your, like, if you're in a long, like, drive tour, what is, what is your must-have snack um, in, the, um, in the bus? Oh, what's a good snack for me? Yeah, like, um, what, if you're, you stop at the gas station or the, or the whatever, what, what are you picking oh, up that you need to have station? on the road? Yeah, yeah. I think I allow myself, like one bag of flaming hot cheetos a tour but i don't like i'm not like a you know what i mean it's like yeah you can get mcdonald's like once a year you know like it's not yeah. like i can subsist on these things but like yeah or like it's yeah. an indulgent or 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 chili cheese fritos too cool. but i don't they're not like part of my daily rotation at all okay what animal were you in your previous life i was the tail of that cat just mm -hmm. the tail. What instrument do you wish you knew how to play? That's a real good question. Um, if I could just snap my fingers and play an instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what would be the most useful? Cello would be good. I do a lot of film scoring and I just always mm -hmm. love cello. Or I just wish I were better. Yeah, I had a Mellotron, but I had to give it back to the band. Um, yeah, I wish I were better at the instruments I do play. <laughs> Can I use that for my wish? You know I what I mean? That. Like, I don't really feel like I don't feel like I'm a guitar player or a piano player. I don't really feel like I'm good at instruments. I respectfully you know I mean? disagree, but this is your interview. Um, okay, thank you. Which American president would you most enjoy fighting in a boxing ring? Who is? I'm gonna Google the shortest president. President. Ever. Don't hack it. Just go off of vibes. James Madison. Okay. Was five four. Oh. I, I want to win. Okay. Our final question: If Guster was a flavor of ice cream, what would it be? You're in Vermont, and I hope Ben and Jerry are listening. We would be uh, Seder Sunday. What would that taste like? I don't know. What that, I don't know what that means. <laughs> like. Uh, bitter herbs and Judaism, <laughs> or, ma or matzo ball, like matzo ball ice cream. <laughs> oh, gross! Ryan, you have been such a cool guest, and this has been—I like—I cannot say enough. What a dream come true it is to be interviewing you. Um, I'm so excited for all of our listeners to hear the ooh la la. It was a lot of pressure. I really didn't want to blow it. No, it's no pressure. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm glad I didn't blow it. This episode of Basic Folk was produced by Angel Human C.J. Nungesser. Our music composed by Alex Stanton. Basic Folk is on the Bluegrass Situation Podcast Network. You can find all of our episodes there. You can find us on the SiriusXM app by searching for Basic Folk. Check us out on FolkAlley.com or on FolkAlley's mobile app. You can find us at our website, BasicFolk.com, or wherever you get podcasts.
Share this episode of Basic Folk with any Dave Matthews Band, Grateful Dead, or Fish fans in your life. These are people who have been on your back trying to get you into these bands for years. They love improvisation. They love having a good time. They need to hear this episode of Basic Folk. Send it they to They love them. goofy white men. Goofy white men with, honestly, great vibes. Okay, thank you for listening all the way to the end. Lizzie and I super duper love you a lot, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.